Welcome to Tokyo College Webinar. I'm Masaki Sano, Deputy Director of Tokyo College. Tokyo College is aiming to share new knowledge for an inclusive society. Today, we deliver a dialogue entitled, Can I, Can AI and Human Understand Each Other? From now, Dr. Arisa Emer, Institute for Future Initiatives, the University of Tokyo, will moderate the session. Arisa, please start. Thank you, Professor Sano, for your kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to moderate this interesting topic. So I would like to introduce two wonderful speakers from our university, Professor Hench and Professor Kuniyoshi. Today, both speakers will talk 30 minutes each and then we will have 30 minutes discussion and question and answers. If you have some questions to professors, please use Q&A function at Zoom. So time is limited, so let's get started. The first presenter, Professor Hensch Takao Kurt, is a director of International Research Center for Neurointelligence at the University of Tokyo. He is also a professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology, Center for Brain Science at Harvard University. He specializes in neuroscience and brain development. So Professor Hensch, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I will share my screen and I'm very honored uh, to represent the work that's being done at IRCN the International Research Center for Neurointelligence uh, here today. Our center was launched uh, three years ago with a very broad and exciting mission to try and understand how does human intelligence arise? As many of you can think, there are many definitions of intelligence. And perhaps the most common is to think of complex problems and the ability to solve them. But there are many other ways to define intelligence. And to truly understand intelligence, one might think that to make an artificial copy of our intelligence would represent a true deep understanding of what it means to be human. In fact, we all know intelligent behavior when we see it. And this year is a very special year because it is the 70th anniversary of what many people think is the birth of artificial intelligence. This man, Alan Turing, published a paper entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence in that year. And it's a quite well-known paper because uh, Dr. Turing proposed what has become known as the Turing test of intelligence. If a computer could be made so intelligent that its behavior was indistinguishable from that of a human to another human, then it could be considered as having intelligence. What's often forgotten, however, is that in the very same paper, he proposes an interesting approach to this problem. And again, it's a very clever, and so I'd just like to read it to you. Instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. This is a rather brilliant idea that we could simulate the development of what he believed to be a much simpler brain, the child's brain, and then by educating the computer, you could achieve the much more complex behaviors of the adult brain. As we'll soon see, the child's brain is by no means simple, but it was an inspiring idea. And in fact, the search for a new approach to artificial intelligence, taking clues from developing brain is in fact our approach and mission at IRCN. Another famous uh, Cambridge professor who uh, defined intelligence in a much broader uh, way is also an inspiration for us. Stephen Hawking, the famous mathematician and late astro astrophysicist, 
once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. And I believe this broad definition of intelligence is quite useful because it opens the possibility for experimentation and also the fact that not only humans might be intelligent. In fact, our intelligence is the result of two major events, one on a slow time scale, that of evolution. Animals from the lowest mouse to the magnificent human have adapted their brains to the environment in which they live. And each of our brains is somehow efficiently processing and adapted to the environment in which we are supposed to be active. This is a very slow process through millennia of genetic mutations and adaptations, which has led to the structure of our brain, which is a very complex lattice or network of neurons connected to each other through synapses or connections between two neurons. And in fact, it is this structure of the brain, these neural networks in the brain, which are made up of multiple layers that inspires current artificial intelligence. Deep learning and uh, deep neural networks in the current artificial intelligence are based on this brain structure, which has been evolving over thousands of years. But there is another very important step in defining human intelligence. And that happens inside each of us through development. Our exposure to our environment shapes dramatically who we are. If we are born in Japan, we learn Japanese. If we were born in the United States, we speak English. And yet the brain, which starts very similar in both countries, can adapt to match these different settings. This is through a very complex process of what we call brain plasticity and pruning and rewiring of circuits. These aspects are far less included in current artificial intelligence. So let me take a moment to define brain plasticity. Brain plasticity is the process or the ability to alter brain function in response to experience. And so as an experimental biologist, we like to define these terms more specifically. We need to know first, how does the brain work in order to understand how it will change in response to experience? And this is a very difficult question which occupies the majority of neuroscience researchers to understand how the brain works. But it was very elegantly summarized by my co colleague at Harvard, Steven Pinker, when he was uh, asked by a late night uh, comedy TV show host, how does the brain work in five words or less? And Steven Pinker brilliantly answered, brain cells fire in patterns. This captures the idea that our brain is full of electrical activity. Each of those neurons communicates with each other by firing uh, electrical potentials called action potentials. And moment by moment, as you're listening to me or thinking in your bed or having breakfast or moving around, all of those behaviors and thoughts reflect activity patterns in the brain. Brain plasticity then is the result of different kinds of patterns of activity which change the connection strength between neurons. And there are uh, equally short and memorable phrases to summarize this. Around the time of Turing's paper, Donald Hebb, a psychologist, published a very influential book in which he proposed the idea that neurons that repeatedly fire at the same time will get stronger in their connection. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And several years later, it was proposed that maybe strengthening connections is not enough. In fact, it could be dangerous that all neurons will eventually be firing and wiring together. And so the opposite plasticity rule was postulated, that if neurons fire out of synchrony, they will get weaker or lose connections. And so these are very simple, but quite descriptive and accurate uh, rules about how experience can shape 
our brain. So in the laboratory, we redefine brain plasticity more specifically. In the brain, the ability to do anything is the reflection of specific molecules. And you will hear about some examples as I go on. A brain function is the activity in very specific circuits. So the circuit from the eye to the back of our brain is responsible for vision. The circuit from the ear through many relay stations to the side of our uh, cortex is responsible for hearing and so on. And as far as the brain is concerned, every experience we have is a pattern of activity. And so I'd like you all to keep this in mind when we talk about the neurobiology of brain development. In fact, most AI models are missing a very fundamental uh, ingredient. The fact that neurons actually come in two flavors. There are excitatory neurons, neurons that communicate with each other to activate each other, but they are surrounded by inhibitory neurons. Cells, when they are active, cause their target cells to become more quiet. And so there's a very delicate balance between excitation and inhibition at work in the biological brain that allows us to think and act and move. And so this balance is something that needs to be considered when thinking about next generation artificial intelligence, because it is this balance of excitation and inhibition which determines those patterns of activity in our brain. As far as development is concerned, it's interesting that recent research suggests one specific type of inhibitory neuron may be particularly important. And these are features that need to be considered in uh, building next generation AI. So how do we make a neuro-inspired computation possible? At IRCN, our researchers are focused on four areas that capture the idea of plasticity on the one hand and activity patterns on the other. Plasticity, as I've been saying, is the ability to change neural circuits in response to experience. This is a feature that is very uh, strong in the young brain. And we call these uh, developmental windows critical periods. Over days, months, years, the infant's brain is shaped to adapt to the environment into which they are born. But even as adults, we can change the activity patterns of our adult, uh, mature, more stable circuits through a process called neuromodulation. If we are paying attention, it's easier to learn new things. If we are not paying attention, it becomes much harder. And this can be regulated uh, very acutely. On the other hand, coding refers to how the activity in the brain is utilized. So our brains are making predictions constantly about the outside world and trying to detect if there is a mismatch between our prediction and what is actually going on outside. This is how we move around the world and how we can learn new facts when things don't align. However, we all know that the brain can operate offline, so to speak, and has spontaneous activity or intrinsic activity. This is what we call thinking or dreaming when we're asleep. The brain never shuts down. And so we at IRCN are very much focused, unlike many other places in the world, on this aspect of mental dynamics and how the activity in the structures that have evolved over many, many thousands of years can make each one of us different and make each one of us uh, more plastic throughout life. Now, an important aspect of understanding is to appreciate what happens when things go wrong. And in fact, an, another important aspect of our center is the focus on mental disorders. So in fact, when activity patterns are atypical or when plasticity does not happen at the right time, you might see a disorder emerge such as autism spectrum disorders or schizophrenia. And this is a very important uh, test case for our understanding of human cognitive abilities. And in fact, is going to become important if we fully achieve artificial intelligence. So let me take a few examples of this work. 
You will hear a lot about prediction in the next talk, so I will focus on the other three today. So critical periods, as I've mentioned, is the fact that the brain changes dramatically during early life. And in fact, we know that this brain plasticity goes up and down at different times in different brain regions. And if you're interested in the details of this kind of research, we published a review article very recently <clears throat> in September of this year, which captures what I'm about to tell you. There are many such windows which allow us to build our sensory systems, such as hearing or seeing, and this allows us then to make more complex behaviors like language, and ultimately uh, this allows us to do even more complicated things like planning and thinking and executive function, as we call it. The study of critical periods in animal models has made tremendous advances that I don't have time to explain in detail, but we, do, we now know that this balance of excitation to inhibition, the green neuron here representing excitatory cells which outnumber the red neuron, which are these inhibitory basket type cells, mature at a different time in different brain regions. And this can explain in part why critical periods happen at different times in different brain regions. In fact, even at this level, there are multiple time scales that become important. So the excitatory inhibitory balance allows uh, oscillations in neural activity, which can be very fast as a signature of these critical periods. The cells develop gradually over months to years through many loops of circadian cycles, so day and night cycles, and the slow development of these cells may be in part relevant for neurodevelopmental disorders if they don't happen at the right time. And eventually, these critical periods will close because gene programs are closed through epigenetic uh, regulation. These are all complicated biological concepts, but already knowing these facts has led to many, many interesting observations for artificial intelligence. The excitatory inhibitory balance in the brain is changing dynamically across development, and this determines when the brain becomes more or less plastic. During the critical period, synaptic connections are pruned, and we think this is an optimization process to make the brain circuit more efficient and maybe in the end lose, use less power to uh, perform computations in the adult brain. A very important component is attention. Even infants, if they are not paying attention, will not show as much plasticity as those infants who are very active and engaged in the process. And attention is important for determining which inputs are necessary for survival and which ones can be ignored. These critical periods we now appreciate are closed by molecules we call plasticity breaks. And these are uh, factors that will prevent too much plasticity from continuing after the critical period. And so it, it suggests that stabilizing the circuit is just as important as being plastic early in life. So there's a balance, again, between plasticity and stability, which changes over development. Knowing this, it's now become possible to actually reopen a critical period in adult animals. And this suggests that we can maybe use this kind of mechanism to relearn something that AI, current AI programs have great difficulty uh, doing. If they learn one task extremely well, they have a difficulty to learn a new task because they will then lose what they have learned before. Humans are not like that. We are able to modify and adjust and acquire multiple skills through uh, this process of brain development. And finally, we have to wonder, why do we close critical periods in the first place? From mouse to human, these break-like factors emerge and uh, actively prevent too much rewiring. And this, we think, is protective. In fact, uh, too much plasticity may be damaging to the nervous system. And so this is a way of becoming resilient towards uh, brain injury and so on. 
So this was one example of how developmental uh, neurobiology is leading to new concepts for artificial intelligence. But I will move on. I talked about intrinsic activity or spontaneous activity in the brain. This is something that can be measured even in human beings using a technique such as functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And in fact, we can look at the brains of individuals who have neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism and find that the brain is constantly active in all humans. And the transitions between different states when the individual is at rest can tell us something about uh, their uh, cognitive capabilities. And so this is the work of Dr. Watanabe at the IRCN, who has looked at the imaging data from many, many subjects, uh, typically developing people, as well as high functioning autistic subjects. And he found that in an energy landscape model that uh, subjects who have autism actually spend more time in stable major states and less time transitioning between such major states. And so it becomes possible then to use computational approaches to perhaps uh, predict or detect uh, subtle differences in brain activity related to their uh, mental capabilities. And in fact, one uh, important aspect of IRCN work is to use current machine learning to classify uh, diseases or disorders of the brain such as uh, this work from uh, Dr. Koike and colleagues, um, looking at MRI images of the brain structure, or using dynamical approaches, dynamic systems approaches to predict before diseases occur by looking at fluctuations in time series activities like the brain waves or gene expression patterns. But prediction is not enough. We can in fact uh, use this to intervene. And so um, in one example of research from our own laboratory, we found that um, machine learning can help us to detect when neurodevelopmental disorders might arise. And in fact, uh, one interesting component of brain function, as I've mentioned, is neuromodulation, attention or arousal. And you can detect this um, outside the brain by looking at uh, a peripheral marker such as the pupil. The size of your pupil will change if you are more attentive or less attentive. And the same is true in a mouse. As you see here in image four, the animal is, is paying great attention with a very wide pupil as compared to image six. With mice, you can manipulate their genes to alter their attention level. And uh, a molecule that's important in their uh, attention system is called acetylcholine. And in fact, a mouse which has elevated acetylcholine signaling shows much higher levels of open pupil size. They are more attentive. And in fact, you can train a, a modern current uh, deep neural network to detect these attention and arousal states using this data from mice and then apply it to mouse models of autism spectrum disorders or other neurodevelopmental disorders. For example, in pink, you see uh, the uh, pupil sizes of mouse model of Rett syndrome, which is a, a disorder that um, reflects the disruption of a gene called MECP2. And in fact, if you restore MECP2 only to the acetylcholine neurons, you can fix this um, altered states of arousal. But what's very important here is that you can use this data from mice and retrain the neural network using data from humans. In fact, there are patients uh, at uh, Boston Children's Hospital who come to the Rett syndrome clinic. This is a very rare disorder. And uh, you can measure attention or arousal using either their pupil size or heart rate variability and uh, retrain the network on human data and successfully predict which individuals will go on to have more severe Rett syndrome than uh, others. And so this is a nice example illustrating how neurobiology combined with artificial intelligence allows us to uh, make predictions about uh, humans and what might be happening in um, these neurodevelopmental disorders. But the ultimate test of understanding 
might be if we can make a model or an artificial intelligence that is so accurate that it will develop a mental illness itself when things go wrong. And this is an interesting challenge that uh, most people may not have thought of, but in fact, if we are so good at understanding human intelligence that we can make a faithful copy, this too should be possible and might be a side effect or consequence of uh, our approach that we need to be aware of. This kind of result was recently obtained by an amazing team of researchers from IRCN, Dr. Haro Kasai and uh, Dr. Shin Ishii, affiliated faculty member from uh, Kyoto University, and uh, Dr. Sho Yagishita, who is uh, in the Kasai laboratory. These two papers and a third one I will mention illustrate how a biological hypothesis validated in a living animal led to a computational model which could then show signs of mental illness. So what did they do? They studied learning. And this is quite famous experiment of uh, Pavlovian conditioning. Everyone uh, must remember Pavlov's dog will learn that there will be a reward if there is a, a tone repeatedly presented together with an unconditioned stimulus such as uh, food. So that finally, just hearing the tone will allow the animal to salivate and expect a reward. Several years ago, a major discovery was made that particular cells in the brain that use the neurotransmitter dopamine will respond to this reward. In fact, it's more than that. As you see in this first line, uh, these black dots represent the firing of these neurons, action potentials, and R represents when the reward uh, is given, in this case, food. These neurons fire in response to reward. But after repeatedly pairing a tone with food reward, these cells start to become active even before the reward is given, just after the conditioned stimulus, or CS. And so they acquire a new kind of response. However, if occasionally you only give the conditioned stimulus with no reward, these cells stop firing. And this indicates that the, what the neuron cares about is not so much the reward itself, but rather the prediction and the accuracy of their prediction, whether a reward will be coming. And so it led to a question, how can the same molecule dopamine lead to both uh, response to a reward coming and a no response when the re reward doesn't come. In fact, uh, there are circuits in the brain which underlie this learning. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, in green, these are the dopamine neurons that project to the striatum. And this is a part of the brain that receives input from the cortex. The cortex is processing sensory input, information about the world. This is the conditioned stimulus. And the unconditioned stimulus is the response to food or water. In fact, um, there are three important aspects of this kind of learning called reinforcement learning because the, the rule is reinforced by a reward. When a tone is paired with the unconditioned stimulus, then eventually a dopamine uh, signal is increased into the striatum, and it allows a learning that occurs on these neurons labeled D1. These D1 neurons are called D1 because they have a receptor subtype called D1 for dopamine. When this repeated learning occurs, then eventually you only need the sensory input to lead to the response. But this is a very generalized learning because other tones will also lead to the response. And so the animal has learned that a tone leads to uh, food reward. This generalization is quite different from a specification of which uh, tone is to be rewarded. So if you then repeatedly uh, fail to give a reward to a very specific tone, then there will be a dopamine dip and a loss of dopamine in the striatum. This uh, leads to a learning on a different type of neuron 
as discovered by uh, Drs. Kasai and Ishii, called the D2 neuron. And this is the D2 neuron because it contains a receptor of the se second dopamine receptor subtype, D2. This eventually leads to a loss of response to the tone that does not give the reward. And that's what we call discrimination learning. This is quite different from a third process called extinction, which we won't talk about today, that does not produce uh, dopamine um, rise or dip. And in fact, um, using D1 and D2 cells, they can ac accurately predict when uh, rules are generalized or discriminated. And this also leads to a prediction about mental illness that perhaps in cases of psychosis or hallucination, positive symptoms of schizophrenia, for example, there may be an overgeneralization and a failure to discriminate. The details of how this works at the cellular level are too complex for me to describe to you today, but I just want to point out that the same neurotransmitter dopamine in red acting through different receptors, D1 and D2, can have opposite effects on the intracellular mechanisms underlying uh, the strengthening or weakening of connections. And what's important here is that these are two separate pathways for learning reward and learning regret or punishment or failure to get a reward. Dr. Ishii and his colleagues made a computational model of this um, where the two pathways of reward were uh, implemented in the last stages of this uh, model. And in this model, they could then impair just the D2 pathway and see what would happen to the performance of a robot, for example, that is learning both reward and punishment. And so this is illustrated in this one picture here from the most recent paper. If a robot learns that there is a reward in each of the four corners of an open arena, but is punished for bumping into the walls, then it will perform uh, very quickly and more efficiently using this model of separated D1 and D2 pathways. However, in cases where the input into the model is noisy in particular, and the D2 pathway is corrupted, then an artificial response is appearing here where a reward was never presented. A kind of hallucination of reward emerges in this model. And in fact, this could be very relevant for understanding mental illness, such as psychosis, where there is an overgeneralization of input and uh, perhaps an imagined reward area. And so in this case, a prediction is made that repairing or acting on the D2 system would in fact correct this kind of uh, impairment. And it is interesting to note that um, the common first generation and even second generation antipsychotic drugs act as dopamine D2 antagonists. So to summarize, we are interested in understanding how human intelligence arises. This is a process that we all go through in development and in fact allows us to function in society. And there are many types of intelligence as I mentioned at the beginning. Understanding these principles that happen in biology may allow us to build more effective or uh, accurate models in artificial intelligence systems. But this is not enough. In fact, many of you might think that neurointelligence is to do something more than human intelligence, something like a super intelligence might emerge if we can combine the strength of AI with human intelligence. But what I showed you today is that it is equally important to understand when intelligence might go off track. And in fact, the great hope is that we can use artificial intelligence then to perhaps correct some of these derailed trajectories. And so some of our missions and our goals include the promotion of resilience and to predict before disease or disorders occur based on these uh, neurobiological principles to promote therapy once um, we detect such trajectories are impaired, and then maybe someday to enhance cognition beyond what humans are capable of now. 
This is the work of many teams of researchers at IRCN working on many different topics and supported by a number of core systems, core facilities that allow us to use state-of-the-art equipment and technologies, as well as uh, animal models and computational analyses and uh, communication to uh, fellow scientists and the public, as well as a wide network of international partners uh, in our global network at IRCN, including uh, Harvard University and Boston Children's Hospital and uh, many others. And finally, all of you who are interested in human life can join our mission through many of our outreach events. Next year, we are planning a major outreach event at the Miraikan starting in February of 2021. And we welcome all of you to come and share your thoughts on what is neurointelligence and how we can achieve our mission. Our mission to conclude is to understand how the brain develops uh, and uh, extract principles of this process so that we can innovate new AI technologies based on these principles and in this process, unravel mechanisms of mental illness and neurodevelopmental disorders. By doing all of these things, we hope to elucidate the basis for human intelligence and how it arises, and perhaps how we can understand AI better, and maybe someday AI can understand us. So thank you very much. I will stop my talk here. Thank you, Professor Hansch. It is very interesting to know how human uh, or like how neuroscience and artificial intelligence technology interact and contribute to understand human intelligence. <coughs> so I think there are a lot of these lot of questions, but um, I would like to move on to the next speakers first. So if you have uh, some questions, please use Q&A function and we accept both English and Japanese questions. So the next speaker, I would like to introduce Professor Yasuo Kuniyoshi. He is the director of the Next Generation Artificial Intelligence Research Center and a professor at the Graduate School of Information Science and Technology, University of Tokyo. He specializes in robotics and artificial intelligence. So Professor Kuniyoshi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arisa, and good morning. Uh, let me start my slide. So today I'm going to talk uh, uh, with this title, uh, what is missing in AI and robots to be understandable for humans or to be able to understand humans. Um, so uh, the, the overall theme of today's uh, Tokyo College, uh, as I hear from uh, uh, Professor, Professor Sano uh, is, can AI and humans understand each other? And then when I break down this uh, uh, question into several uh, sub items, uh, there's, there's some uh, first, um, and this is uh, a typical and uh, uh, reasonable response. Uh, current AI has no capacity to really understand anything. So uh, we, uh, specialists uh, uh, wonder that uh, general public, the people who are not specialists uh, in of AI technology might have some uh, uh, anxiety or misconception that uh, AI can do everything or anything. Um, uh, however, uh, AI is uh, uh, currently a very specific uh, technology. And uh, uh, one reasonable uh, attitude is that uh, AI is just a tool and uh, it's a tool for many things, uh, including uh, for scientific understanding of humans. Um, but also uh, this is sometimes used as a rhetoric uh, for avoiding uh, public anxiety, which I mean that uh, yes, it is, uh, just a tool and it, it is not capable of really understanding anything at this moment. However, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, it, it is, uh, is not possible forever, you know. Um, so, and I step forward 
uh, to uh, claim that actually AI should be become able to understand things and humans. And this is almost uh, this uh, uh, equivalent to saying that AI should have a, a human-like mind. Um, another uh, point is that uh, uh, there's a famous black box problem and uh, it's essentially says that it is impossible for humans to uh, understand what's going on inside AI. And uh, uh, to, uh, as a counter uh, measure to this problem, uh, currently there's a very active research R&D going on uh, in the area called uh, explainable AI and trusted AI. Um, but uh, beyond that, uh, we really should uh, look at uh, 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 real communication or even emotional expressions so that we can really um, intuitively understand uh, what's going on inside AI. And again, that's related to mind. Uh, another related typical question will be, uh, will AI be superhuman? Now, this is uh, very, uh, you have to be very careful when you address this question. Um, I would ask, uh, what do you mean by super in this case, right? So just, just think about uh, automobile, telephone, a calculator. These are all superhuman in one particular functional function uh, or one axis. In that aspect, AI is already superhuman, as you all know. Um, however, uh, if you say superhuman, in your in your conception, like uh, uh, like the Kurzweil says, in um, what do you really imagine? And uh, can, do you define any axis? Is it just a, a amount of uh, uh, knowledge or uh, the the speed of computation? Or what is it? What is it? So, is there anything uh, called, uh, such as a superhumanity? And then finally, uh, the question uh, uh, is, I make is, a should or can AI have human mind? Now, uh, as a scientist, uh, if you think, uh, uh, so I would say that uh, there's no scientific reason to think it is impossible to reproduce it. Um, if you, if you uh, deny that, uh, that is like uh, you have to uh, introduce some some mystery, some some um, some something, some principle that that is beyond uh, physical or or you know the real world uh, phenomena. Uh, it's like a god or occultism. So uh, if you think scientifically, and uh, our brain is made up of uh, uh, based on physics. And uh, so it's, it's reasonable to expect that at, at some point in the future, uh, the mind could be reproduced. Uh, so self-aware AI, is it dangerous uh, really? So uh, we have to, again, uh, think very carefully I would comment that uh, actually unaware AI is very dangerous. So these, these are all the points uh, uh, relevant to the, the theme of this today's topic. And uh, I discuss about uh, 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 some of the content I talk about in this paper. And then first, uh, let's address the question, should AI or robots have human mind? Um, I think uh, many of you may have heard about the problems pointed out with current AI. Um, the first example is a very famous one called uh, diversarial images. And uh, uh, if you take up a very typical uh, AI application, which is uh, image recognition, uh, of, it is called the general uh, object uh, recognition, uh, which in which uh, you feed um, uh, many of these uh, photos uh, as input and then uh, teach, uh, train the net neural network to tell 
uh, what's in the, the photo, uh, in this case, a school bus. Uh, so you, you, you train the network uh, with like millions of uh, such uh, examples. And then after learning this, the system can tell what's, what's in the, the photo. Now you do that. And then uh, the network uh, answers correctly as school bus. But then if you add in a particular uh, very specific noise, uh, adding that noise to the original image and the result looks like not much different for human eyes. Uh, however, the system suddenly starts to answer that this is ostrich. Uh, this is very weird. Uh, but uh, uh, it is shown that uh, you can derive a, a particular algorithm to uh, generate uh, such results for any given image. Now, but for us, is this is a kind of unacceptable. This is like a, a really inhuman uh, deviation. Uh, it's like a, we do not expect uh, such things to happen. Now, the other uh, example is uh, called a uh, uh, reward designing problem. And this is, uh, again, a famous example in what is called uh, reinforcement learning, uh, which is that the AI system tries, tr does trial and error learning uh, of a, a known repertoire. It, uh, and uh, as it tries uh, various things, it gets sometimes gets rewards, uh, telling the, the uh, whether the the action was uh, uh, good or bad. Uh, so this is uh, one result of the uh, system uh, which did the reinforcement learning uh, in a particular game, which in which uh, the task is to. Uh, drive or operate the, the boat from start to goal as fast as possible, as, as quickly as possible. But the result was, uh, as you saw, it was like weird uh, going around and around and hitting things around. Uh, why this happened was that uh, actually this was a particular uh, case when uh, this, uh, you can gain points uh, because you hit items, you get some points, and then the item uh, reappears after a particular uh, time. And if you go in circle at a particular pace, you infinitely gain more and more points. So this is, uh, 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 for the system, it's a reasonable and optimized uh, behavior. However, for us, it is completely unintended. This is uh, this is not what we wanted the system to learn. So, again, uh, the problem is that the the, the system doesn't share uh, any like uh, common sense or uh, or our intention. So this these are the po uh, problems. And the next one is uh, the famous black box problem or data bias problem where uh, if you uh, search on the internet uh, for, for example, grandma, and then the result, uh, you get uh, a bunch of pictures. But then if you carefully look at them, this is a, a, this is a very biased result because you see mostly uh, white faces, uh, Anglo-Saxon-like uh, uh, face, uh, uh, faces here, which does not represent the uh, 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 population uh, in the world. So why is that? Because uh, the system learns from uh, the uh, data on the net and the data uh, on the net itself is uh, uh, biased, naturally biased. And uh, the system is doing the right thing but the data itself is already biased. And, uh, but the result is unacceptable because uh, we want uh, a, the concept uh, of grandma to represent uh, uh, appropriately the, the balance of uh, uh, various people. So in short, uh, uh, 
if you uh, current AI learns from the big data, however, it's not enough. Uh, sometimes we need a, a correctness in the sense of uh, a consensus of a society and which does not exist in uh, reality. Actually, it's not in the data. It's a, a counterfactual uh, concepts. And uh, so how, how can an AI system understand such a thing? These are problems. And uh, I also want to touch on uh, uh, the famous three laws of robotics uh, proposed by Asimov. Of course, it's, it's just in a science fiction. However, uh, there's uh, uh, very important things uh, to look at that it states actually essentially important things uh, for autonomous systems uh, if uh, the systems uh, to be used in our human society. Uh, that a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allows a human, allow a human uh, being to come to harm and, and, vice, and so on. Now, um, these are statements. However, when you think about uh, a programming a robot uh, to uh, abide by these uh, laws, it's, it's actually very difficult or impossible uh, with the state of our uh, technology to do that because um, you know it, it's it's you have to uh, uh, deal with the infinitely many possibilities uh, when you say injure or harm what does that ex what exactly mean uh, can you define these in terms of uh, sensor signals or you know uh, images or whatever. Uh, it can mean physiological or mental or social or professional uh, things. And uh, so there are even infinite variety and sometimes invisible, abstract, um, very difficult. So, so there are many difficult uh, problems uh, for AI to be uh, really usable in a uh, society. So recent, in the recent years, there are many um, uh, activities uh, working on uh, to define uh, what, what we require for uh, AI systems to be uh, ben truly beneficial to humans. And uh, they can, uh, boil down into these uh, requirements, understanding, safety, alignment with human values, uh, fairness, accountability, and transparency, collaboration, and acceptance. And uh, these uh, actually can be further boiled down. And then my point is that actually these are the, the really the functions of uh, human mind. So that's why I claim that actually uh, AI or robots should be endowed with human-like mind uh, because uh, it, the super complex automatic uh, real world systems uh, need to be safe. And uh, for this, uh, the system should be able to uh, uh, sort of self-monitor and uh, uh, be able to deal with unexpected situations, uh, not just uh, limited in uh, 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 previous uh, training, uh, but uh, can face uh, new novel situations and should uh, be aut uh, autonomous. Uh, because if you think of, uh, for example, auto driving system, of course, if you have to say like, uh, uh, on each decision of the system, you have to sort of approve, you know, yes, yes, you can steer to the right right now, or uh, you can brake now. I mean, what's the point of having an auto driving system? So you have to um, let the system uh, decide autonomously. Um, and that, that uh, this is, these decisions must be reliable. And uh, but also, also, you have to be able to understand uh, what the AI, why the AI system does it, and uh, to to be able to you know uh, 
uh, really uh, feel safe and uh, uh, feel it's okay that you can let the system do. And for this uh, type of uh, thing, uh, you again need a, a function of the mind like a self-cognition or uh, intentional emotional feeling or communication and things like that. So um, if you think about uh, uh, AI robots and autonomous systems without mind, which means uh, it can do uh, really harmful things without noticing it. It doesn't uh, care where you are there you know, in the, in the uh, vicinity of the system. And uh, uh, then the, this is really scary, dangerous and useless. So that's the first point. And then um, the next point is that uh, can AI or robots have human mind? And uh, a famous uh, concept uh, 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 here is, is called that strong AI versus weak AI. And there are uh, several versions of this. this. Uh, originally, um, uh, John Searle uh, brought up this concept of strong AI. And the, here's the original uh, uh, statement. Uh, but the point is that uh, a strong AI is a strong create claim that uh, basically a artificially built system can have a real mind. Um, and there are many versions, but uh, the, the one I uh, really sub submit to is uh, very close to what uh, Shinsuke Shimojo at uh, Caltech states. Uh, self-aware thoughts and manifest intelligence emerge at the end of metalization and hierarch hierarchization of simple sensory motor chains. This essentially says uh, we should really follow how the natural intelligence emerge or develop. And uh, that's the only way to really um, approach the system that has uh, really a mind. Uh, whereas the weak AI uh, basically says uh, a system, intelligent, seemingly uh, 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 intelligent uh, system, is actually just simulating the ability uh, of uh, our mind. Now, <clears throat> uh, most of the uh, AI researchers or engineers uh, are happy with this uh, diff, uh, type of uh, AI. Uh, because uh, you know it doesn't matter uh, whether it's really having a mind or it's just simulating, as long as uh, the system does useful useful things. Okay, so that's also a reasonable uh, position, uh, but I believe that uh, actually uh, we uh, when we think about the AI that is. Uh, uh, Ben truly beneficial to humans, actually we should look at the strong AI. Uh, so the reason I discussed so far and also by this, that the current system, uh, the typical AI uh, 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 method uh, assumes such a framework. So you model the systems as input output system and then if you uh, data and trains and you tune the processing, uh, really optimize it to yield the, the correct output within the training data set. Um, for this, you really uh, specify a task uh, in terms of inputs and outputs. However, the real uh, living brain is not uh, doing serving such uh, uh, functions. Actually, the brain participates in dynamic interactions uh, in order to live. Uh, so the brain is not determining everything. It's just a, a member of the, the overall interaction through the body, through the environment, and the interactions continues going on and all, always changing. 
right? So uh, this type of view is very important. And uh, if you take that view, uh, it's really important to, if the system is uh, essentially uh, have the such character, uh, you actually, uh, you should not implement the superficial functions like a defined task and uh, then the system will do only that defined task and it doesn't have a capability to develop to acquire uh, new functions or uh, beyond what is uh, defined so far. So uh, not the superficial functions, but look at how the system always emerge uh, functions and uh, goes through a continuous development in dynamics and complex interactions. In this case, it's fundamentally different because in this case, you cannot really define what's optimal because the criteria, the, the boundary conditions or the task is not fixed. So you cannot really optimize. So the system is always changing. To address that, you have to start with certain uh, initial generative principles and and really let it uh, act uh, embedded in body and the environment, interact through the environment and, and exhibit various functionalities uh, and things like that. So, um, right, so um, uh, for, for this uh, type of, uh, Work. Uh, you have to start with, uh, of course, based on uh, knowledge about neuroscience and other uh, uh, human science. And uh, I, I would uh, refer to a big project in uh, Europe uh, called Human Brain Project. And they are uh, uh, really um, mapping out the, the human brain and uh, also the mouse brain. And then they uh, embed that in a, a simulated mouse body and uh, uh, showing a, uh, how they function. Uh, in our case, so here the really important thing is the embodiment. So um, you, you should really not just uh, look at the brain, but uh, uh, it's always interacting through the body with the environment. So uh, the information that the brain gets is actually structured through the embodiment. And uh, so based on this uh, in following the development approach, uh, our question is then uh, what is really happening in the beginning and there some interaction is beginning through the uh, neural system, body and the environment, and then uh, behavior emerges from these interactions. And then uh, this is uh, uh, kept, the structures captured by the plasticity of the neural system. And uh, the continuous development starts. So these are our assumptions. And we claim that uh, uh, body shapes brain. And uh, we have been building a, a embodied neural system model uh, in collaboration with medical doctors. So we get uh, uh, various uh, data from uh, uh, medical data on human uh, fetuses and babies, uh, body model and then brain model and the neural system. And here is uh, 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 learning a uh, neural system model. Uh, actually, this, uh, if you remember, uh, Professor Henshu's uh, talk, uh, uh, a, uh, the learning uh, rule uh, by uh, uh, Donald Hebb. And so this is a, a version of that. And uh, we built a brain model uh, with uh, some uh, later structures. And then we, uh, uh, identify the connectivity uh, in the brain from the uh, MRI data, and then uh, apply uh, that connectivity on the, the 
cortical structure uh, connecting up the simulated neurons. And uh, here, uh, this shows uh, how the, the system, the brain simulation uh, works. Uh, even if you do not feed, feed any input, um, this is a spontaneous activity. And uh, this is the infant version. And uh, uh, we uh, simulate uh, even the fetus version. Okay. And <clears throat> uh, well, I, I have to skip, but uh, this is relevant to uh, how a, a really complex uh, 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 neural system uh, can generate uh, uh, spontaneous uh, moving activities, uh, uh, which is relevant to uh, Professor Hensch's talk uh, uh, related to uh, mental uh, illness and, and you know, um, uh, the variety of states. So when we uh, connect up the nervous system with a simulated uh, body, uh, then the body exhibits spontaneous behavior. And uh, this movie shows how it moves. This is the simulated fetus uh, body. You can see uh, muscles, simulated muscles in red uh, lines. And then the movement is not what we program, but it is generated by the, the spinal circuit of the model. Uh, and uh, the result of experiences. So the, as the baby moves, it feels uh, uh, sensory uh, signals, and then that is fed into the brain. And uh, uh, the brain acquires the pattern and the result will be, this is a close up of the simulated brain after learning. And here, uh, what is called the somatosensory cortex, uh, you see uh, that the brain has acquired a map of self body, uh, head, arm, trunk, and leg, and things like that. And the interesting thing is that we could do a comparative uh, experiments uh, with the body, the, the baby which learned inside the utero in the fetal period versus uh, artificially uh, let the system learn outside the utero, like uh, we put the body outside in the air and let it uh, spontaneously move and learn. Now the results are very different. And actually, uh, we are uh, investigating that uh, probably they have uh, the difference uh, uh, is related to uh, one mental disorder uh, called uh, ASD or this autism spectral um, disorder because uh, there are some uh, possibility that uh, uh, abbreviated uh, fetal period is correlated with ASD. And uh, this uh, provides some hint about uh, how uh, uh, such, uh, you know, less learning period within the utero uh, can provide such a difference. Okay, so <clears throat> um, through this, we are trying to follow a continual uh, development of path, starting from the very early stage with the fetal period, and how it experiences uh, uh, particular uh, information type through move, movement and experience. And it changes as the body grows because the way it uh, uh, contacts the uterine wall or you know, cell body changes. And then after birth, the environment is very different. So the sensory experiences will be very different. And then uh, starts to interact with others, which is again, a new experience. And so gradually these provide different information structures, uh, continuously changing, and that sort of uh, raises the brain functions. That's our idea. 
And uh, this shows uh, a, our uh, robot uh, called Nobi, and it simulates a uh, nine months old baby. And this is good for really uh, simulating a realistic uh, interaction in a real uh, environment with humans uh, in contact. And it is the baby uh, robot is watching an interesting object. And then so it attends to interesting ones. And after a while, it gets bored and look at look for something else and things like that. And uh, we can feed uh, what it experiences to the simulated brain. Recently, we are uh, now starting to work on, on emotional system because that's a very important aspect uh, when you think about the body and uh, brain interaction. Uh, and particularly, we are focusing on cardiorespiratory dynamics and neuromodulators, uh, how uh, brain and this uh, uh, lung and uh, uh, heart system interact. So uh, we are even uh, thinking about uh, how to uh, address the consciousness, but uh, this uh, uh, is, we view the consciousness as uh, like integrative uh, patterns, the global patterns of many, many interactions going through the body or within the nervous systems. And uh, that, that is uh, uh, integrated at uh, some uh, brain uh, structure. So, <clears throat> and recently there's a uh, work by other group uh, showing that even uh, pre-verbal children have uh, the uh, sense of moral morality. And if that's so, uh, I think uh, there's a possibility to continuously connect to such uh, the seed of moral uh, through the development. And that's uh, actually uh, a very important uh, point uh, in uh, building a human-centered or beneficial AI. So back to the initial questions. So these were actually, uh, uh, summarize uh, what we talked about. And uh, our uh, next generation AI center uh, is addressing, this is one approach within this center. Uh, we are addressing new next generation AI from the viewpoint of human like uh, AI or uh, understanding uh, humans. Uh, and also the uh, dynamic real world intelligence, the intelligence that is really reactive and uh, uh, handling dynamic changes in the world and then integrating these to uh, build next AI for humans and society uh, with the collaborations, many, many uh, disciplines uh, like this uh, in our university. So uh, stop here, sorry for going over time. Thank you, Professor Kuniyoshi, for a very interesting discussion. Uh, so we would like to move on to the, the discussion uh, both uh, from the Professor Henshi and Professor Kuniyoshi. So, uh, so I would like to start uh, one question from the audience. So, uh, well, not only the one, uh, there's uh, lots of similar questions uh, regarding like a self-consciousness or self-awareness. So, uh, Professor uh, Kuniyoshi talked about the how the machines were, with self cognition or self -con consciousness can be applied into the society. And uh, Professor Hensch, uh, do you think it is possible for humans to understand self awareness or self consciousness in neuroscience using uh, like a co constructive approach? So we would like to know how the, the current neuroscience uh, state of arts are considering about the, how it can be applied to uh, artificial intelligence or engineering. So could you give your, uh, what do you think about? So, so the question is uh, for uh, professor for, Hensch, right? Uh, yeah, uh, for first the uh, Professor Hensch and then maybe a response from Professor Kuniyoshi. 
Sure. So self-awareness or self-consciousness is, of course, a very challenging topic. Um, most of the work uh, that is currently um, uh, groundbreaking in neuroscience is happening with animals. And so the question arises um, whether the animals have self-awareness. And this is, of course, also a very challenging uh, area. Um, the work on primates in particular is very exciting. Um, but uh, currently, the IRCN is not working in this area directly. Um, I think the, the biggest breakthroughs may come from, as I was saying, uh, including um, cases of mental illness or um, areas where uh, there may be a disruption of, of this kind of self-awareness um, and a partnership with AI to try and simulate uh, what might have been altered under these conditions. But uh, I think we're still quite um, a ways away from uh, getting to this point. But I do understand the question, um, the, the point of um, self-awareness and eventually whether machines can have self-awareness is central to what we're talking about today. So um, maybe I, I'd like to hear Dr. Kuniyoshi's response and then we can have a further discussion. Um, Right. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to say was that, um, you know, bringing up this uh, uh, topic of self-awareness uh, in the context of uh, AI uh, is often avoided because it is dangerous and uh, uh, you could expect a very immediate, uh, uh, immediate uh, reactions, uh, you know, denying or rejecting it. However, my point, I, what I wanted to say is that, uh, wait a minute and be uh, calm down and let's think about it. And uh, so, uh, and when you really think about it, maybe uh, actually that is uh, important for future AI, uh, because if you think about the really, uh, you know, uh, the system should really be able to understand at least a little bit of what, humans think or uh, how what humans want and uh, uh, also uh, maybe it is not just a mystery because uh, on one hand uh, neuroscience is uh, rapidly approaching uh, these uh, uh, phenomena and also um, it, it, like uh, in like us we could think about uh, some computational model uh, that can lead to some primitive form of what we call the consciousness. We, uh, we, it's not clear whether we're seeing the right thing uh, right now, but we believe that uh, uh, we are capturing some aspect of what the self-awareness is, like uh, uh, the system uh, starts to uh, regulate itself uh, and things like that. So these questions, so, you know, we could, maybe we can build some form of it. Maybe it's not uh, really equal to uh, humans yet, but uh, maybe far from it, but still uh, we can gradually address that issue. Then we should actually talk about it. You know, uh, we, do, we shouldn't, uh, close our eyes on, on these issues. That, that was the point I wanted to raise. Thank you, Professor Kunyoshi, okay. and thank you, Professor Hensch. Okay. So I, I also would like to jump into more further because uh, Professor Hensch, you're right now based in the United States and the Professor Kunyoshi in Japan. And uh, I think these discussions has been um, uh, discussed all over the world. And uh, I would like, as a social scientist, I'm interested in like a cultural differences. So is this kind of discussion like a, when I'm, I'm talking with like a people from like a Europe, they might be some, be some kind of really concern about discussing AI, humanizing AI or like uh, inputting this self-conscious into technology because technology, artificial intelligence is just a tool. And uh, so I would like to first, uh, next, this time first ask Kuniyoshi Sensei, Professor Kuniyoshi, uh, what, what do you think? Is it is this kind of interest to self uh, the cogni cognition or the self-conscious robots, artificial intelligence is somehow 
unique to Japanese context, or is it more broadly discussed and it should be uh, you know, addressed from the world? And the next, uh, Professor Hensch. So I think you you're kind of like a based in every, you know United States, and you I think you have, you know a lot of discussion um, from brain sciences uh, and also uh, have insights to artificial intelligence. So do you think uh, do you have this kind of cultural differences among uh, the topic? And uh, if if that's so, how we could collaborate internationally on this topic? So Professor Kuniyoshi, do you have some kind of comments? Right. Um, this this question is uh, often this point is often raised, uh, and uh, I I would say that um, uh, yeah, typically uh, in Japan, um, robots or AI is uh, regarded as by the public that uh, it's like a friend, and uh, uh, it's. So people see, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Doraemon or uh, 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 Astro Boy, which is Atom. Um, so, you know, um, there may be enemies uh, brought uh, in uh, some conception of such, you know, um, friendly image to AI or robots. But uh, deep, the below it uh, on the basement, probably it's uh, like cultural uh, roots, like uh, 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 our culture regards uh, um, everything around us as sort of a uh, living things and like uh, it's like uh, equal to us, like uh, even, even not just animals, but also the trees or the rocks and things like that have some spirits in there and uh, participate in the world. Uh, so we uh, live in the world with all these uh, 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 various organisms and see spirits there. Some kind of that, that, that ground may be uh, uh, the set the, the spaces for this kind of uh, attitude. Whereas probably in the uh, European uh, or uh, American, uh, so the Western world, uh, I'm not sure. So because uh, of the uh, really, I mean, for one thing, uh, Christians may have uh, the the view of the world like uh, uh, tend to you know um, separate humans versus. Uh, uh, something else than humans, you know, human and the world. So, uh, uh, like a, a separate uh, things. So that's uh, maybe the uh, base of the dif different attitude. Um, however, so uh, for this issue of uh, uh, machines, uh, should or can have uh, a human-like mind or behavior. Um, this is an important issue uh, if really we want uh, such systems to be used in our society. So um, regardless of uh, the basic attitude, uh, we should really talk about that and work on that issue uh, internationally. So that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Professor Hensch. Do you have some comments yes. on this? Uh, thank you for this interesting cultural point. Um, I agree with uh, what Professor Kuniyoshi was saying. As I said um, at the beginning of my talk, uh, our brains are shaped early in life through critical periods of experience. And so depending on which culture you are raised in, um, uh, many of our beliefs are set very early, I would say. And um, Japan's relationship with technology has been a very uh, generally positive one, um, as opposed to the Hollywood version of AI and robots, which is always destructive and coming to uh, ruin humanity, um, something to overcome. And so I think if you grow up in such a culture, um, there's lots of concern or fear. Um, it's also culturally true that um, there's a, a, a deep sense of personal autonomy, privacy. Um, if there's a, a, any kind of um, a hint of uh, invasion of privacy by some a third party, whether it's human or robot, it's seen uh, negatively, I'm afraid. 
Um, however, uh, looking to the future, um, two things are uh, happening. One is uh, younger people today are growing up in a different world where um, the internet of things and AI is around us everywhere. Um, they see it as something beneficial. So there will probably be quite a change in the acceptance of these um, um, technological advances. And I think um, it, especially now in this pandemic time has allowed people to remain socially connected um, in ways that would not have been possible during the last pandemic 100 years ago. And so I think there's a growing appreciation for AI in general as being uh, helpful. And um, this is something that can be um, uh, supported on a global scale by uh, showing how the world stays together uh, through these opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to move on to the next question. And uh, I also am interested in this question. So there are a question from a kindergarten teacher. And it says like, uh, it, it's more like uh, your research specific, but more like how it can apply to the society. So the question says, if the brain development of children with kind of autism spectrum disorders were to be clarified, uh, which direction do you think? I think both of you can have some kind of insight in this. Uh, do you think it will go? So one way, promoting therapy to bring those children closer to other children. And the other way is to, because they are different, uh, rather than you know uh, ma making it to the same direction, but rather change the educational system to take advantage of their characteristics. So I, I understand that uh, this is more like a social implication cases, but uh, I would like to know uh, how your research result would be used by the society. So maybe Professor Hench, you have some kind of uh, perspectives on this, how this, how this, this kind of this comments or this questions. Yes, thank you very much. It's a, a very important uh, question. And I think it's the responsibility of scientists to keep this in mind. Uh, the implications of their work um, are, are very important. Um, every human life is precious. And I think the respect for every individual is the most important. Um, the autism spectrum is called a spectrum because there are people who are severely debilitated on the one hand and uh, remarkably gifted on the other. And um, the, the needs are quite different uh, for uh, people on the spectrum. So um, I would see perhaps um, uh, as the research advances, um, there will be um, methods to help those who are really struggling to um, uh, um, you know, I mean, physically struggling to uh, participate in, in society or communicate um, while respecting that um, they have their own unique uh, perspective on life and the world. Um, and this is most clear in the high functioning autistic subjects, um, uh, formerly known as Asperger's, for example. Um, even Alan Turing himself was suggested to perhaps be on this spectrum and uh, we, the world would have lost uh, a, a tremendous uh, insight and um, creativity um, if something was done to kind of normalize someone um, in that context. So um, I hope that uh, the research will be um, used, uh, if you say in that way, to understand the brain and how it can develop in many different ways um, and where necessary um, uh, support people who, who are in a wheelchair or handicapped by their condition, but also allow them to free their mind and communicate um, in the world in which uh, we live in. Um, and so uh, I, I try to take an optimistic view of this, although of course uh, you can imagine uh, some people may misunderstand. Um, human, humans are, individually quite different and autism is one shade of these differences and we need to appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Hensch. Uh, so I guess uh, maybe when you say like uh, seeking for the principles and uh, that might 
be maybe like a socially people might be wondering uh, which which direction uh, you're aiming. And uh, after hearing your answer, I I really uh, uh, agree what you've said. And uh, I think uh, the, these researches could be used or maybe applied to the society uh, to to encourage people with you know, the the variety of characteristics and uh, i think uh, in, in i think that should be used in that way and uh, i am really happy to hear your answer as a social scientist and uh, professor kuniyoshi do you have some kind of comments on yeah <clears throat> uh, you, you also mentioned about this uh principle the ai principles and it's more like a general principle and uh, how your research results can be applied to society and uh, how it can be uh uh, influence uh, or maybe uh, discussed in, in the society? Well, uh, first uh, about the related to the issue of uh, ASD and other so-called uh, disorders, uh, mm -hmm. mental disorders. Um, and I uh, very much agree with uh, Professor Hensch and uh, May I show uh, very quickly one slide? <laughs> and I'm doing that. So, uh, Professor, uh, so this, uh, this shows a uh, very uh, same idea what uh, Hen Dr. Hensch said. So this uh, shows the developmental pathway and uh, uh, we believe, and, uh, and as Dr. Hensch said, uh, individual development takes individual pathways. They are all unique. And uh, you say like you apply certain tests at certain developmental point and uh, classify like this is a typical developmenting, uh, developing uh, child. This is a typical developing child. However, this is not seeing the, the entire uh, uh, tooth. Sometimes uh, trajectory will go away, but then come back and things like that. So the point is to understand how in each individual develop uh, and uh, how it, uh, they respond to uh, environmental conditions and things like that. So this is important. So uh, my, my point is that our research of like simulating uh, the development although it is really crude at this stage, but you know, when it comes more precise, then uh, it could provide a tool to understand how the development changes uh, in re uh, response to uh, inter interventions or conditions and things like that. And um, probably be uh, helpful for designing uh, or um, customizing uh, proper uh, environment or care for individuals. Another point is that uh, I believe that uh, it is not, uh, I take a position that it is not the uh, right idea to set something like a gold standard, uh, 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 you know, uh, Opt opt optimal uh, human. So uh, there's no such thing. So um, it, it's a uh, it's not a right idea to you know try to uh, fix the problems to to make the one individual uh, uh, closer to the sort of defined virtual uh, gold standard but look at individuals and think about or and work on how one individual can live better in, in you know in it uh, individual lifestyle and things like that so to do that you have to understand how how individual is living and then interacting with the world and then uh what will change in which directions and things like that. so to to understand that uh, individual dynamics, uh, our approach might uh, be able to contribute. Thank you so very that's much. A, that's my answer. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about intelligence, uh, we 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 kind of rush to the 
uh, the the answer that uh, there's might be there might be one you know ideal like a golden uh, you know standard. But uh, after hearing both of your comments, uh, I I'm really appreciated to know that uh, there's a variety of lives and uh, you know the and uh, also thoughts and uh, the way of living and uh, I think that that's how we live together and uh, how we can create the society and make the society better. So in order to do so, uh, this is my last question. I'm, I'm sorry, there's a lot of question, but I would like to raise this question at the last one. So in order to do to, in, to, to pursue that kind of society, I think we need to collaborate. So various uh, experts and also the the discussion from the public is required and I, I i think both of your institutions the rlcn and the ai center is multidisciplinary organization and uh, so could you uh kind of like a state uh, one or two comments about uh, how you can put those multi uh, disciplinary discussion like uh, how how you can collaborate the society sociology or the the psycho psychology or like the economics politics and uh, how um how how we can um how how it's difficult or maybe how it is beneficial to have that kind of multidisciplinary discussion and uh, i think uh, that that will be uh become a comment uh, or maybe some messages to the general public who are listening. So not only the experts, but also the public perspectives will be very beneficial for that. So uh, in, including this kind of uh, topic, uh, I would like to hear some kind of messages from both of you, how we as a citizen can also contribute or maybe collaborate to your research. So maybe Professor Hensch, uh, can you start first? Thank you so much. Um, the research we do touches everyone and everything. Um, we are all users of our brain and we are all defined by our brain. And so I think everybody has um, a voice in this, um, in this very exciting research and um, mission to try and understand what makes us human. And um, what, we, what we can do as a research center is so limited um, we have uh, experts in, in certain areas, and we are trying to be um, multidisciplinary at the science level, but at the social science level, it's absolutely essential to hear from uh, everyone and their, their uh, community experience. Just like you asked your question about cross-cultural differences in the perception of AI, um, there is no one correct answer. Uh, we all have uh, evolved to a, a different solution, perhaps, on some issues. And um, appreciating um, those perspectives is what makes uh, life exciting and um, enriching and rewarding. And um, together, we can build a better um, social intelligence and a better, um, or I hate to use the word better because it sounds judgmental, but um, a, a newer um, understanding of what it means to be human. And so, um, as I mentioned at the end of my talk, uh, we will continue to do outreach events like at the Miraitan, where uh, people can come and hear what we are trying to do, fusing neurobiology and clinical science with AI, um, but also um, participate in uh, explaining what they think neurointelligence is and what the future will look like. And uh, I think together we can uh, really build something new and exciting. Thank you, Professor Hensch and uh, Professor Kuniyoshi. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, uh, on the research side, uh, uh, what we are uh, dealing with is uh, uh, requires essentially multidisciplinary approach: the human uh, mind, intelligence, behavior, uh, modeling. Uh, and of course, including a, a very important collaboration with the IRCN. Uh, and uh, also uh, we are collaborating uh, with uh, sociologies, uh, uh, psychology, uh, because uh, we have first as a research, on the research side, we, uh, the important question is what really is human? So when you think about uh, AI or robots, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, co coming, 
closer and closer to what we think a uh, uh, human is, then you have to rethink what really is, makes a human human. So uh, this requires uh, all, all, all fields of science and uh, you know, uh, philosophy and uh, everything. On the other hand, uh, as I talked in my uh, uh, talk, um, uh, we, ha we have to uh, think about, uh, it's really important for us to, uh, uh, how, how we can design a, a next uh, you know, future society uh, with AI and robotics, uh, which helps, you know, uh, uh, humans, you know, life, and how can we make these technologies beneficial uh, to humans? Um, for this, the intimate uh, collaboration discussions with all people uh, who uh, create the next world. Actually, it's everybody, you know. So not just uh, a specialist uh, in certain fields, but uh, all, the, all the citizens, uh, active players in creating the next generation society and defines what, what we want, you know. And so, and point to think about is, we, we don't have to stick to the classical view of the, our society is, but we can freely design and create a vision of what really uh, a human society should be. And then technology uh, should evolve uh, towards that goal. So, and, and the society design should ev uh, evolve uh, in, uh, you know, partnership with this technological evolution. So these two, must like uh, I, I always interact uh, together and then uh, collaboratively uh, create what we think we want, you know, uh, what we think it should be in the future. So in this sense, uh, everybody, all the citizens uh, should participate in this uh, activity. And uh, we always uh, try to uh, discuss, listen, what people say, and it always affects our thinking. So, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, both professors. So, um, sorry, I, there's a lots of another interesting questions, and I would like to go on, but uh, I think uh, it will uh, end the day. So, uh, I, I would like to conclude the program today uh, here. So, thank you, Professor Hensh and Professor Kuniyoshi for your uh, great talks. And uh, thanks for mentioning that uh, it's, it's us that's actually creating the society. And uh, how it's, it's a very strong message both from you that uh, we can both, uh, we can all be involved in this kind of discussion. And I think this uh, webinar uh, become a great uh, introduction to the, the general public and also the experts from different disciplines who are interested in this brain science, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence, and society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.